Welcome back to our coaching theory discussions. Today we're going to talk about biomechanics. Biomechanics are the study of mechanical laws relating to the movement or structure of living organisms. So basically how we move in three-dimensional space. Here are the muscular groups. We're not going to go over these, but these are all the major muscle groups that we work with and deal with on a regular basis. So when we're swimming, we're primarily using our deltoids, our lats. So we're talking about we're talking about the muscles up on the shoulders and the back. Uh, when we're cycling, we're using a lot of our glutes and quadriceps, as well as when we're running, when we use our hamstrings and glutes quite a bit, as well as our calves. So depending on which sport we use and which sport we have, uh, we are using different primary muscles. And so these are all the ones that are out there. So the first question is, where do most strength gains come from? I want you to think about this for a second. Does it come from muscular growth? Does it come from meta uh, metabolism efficiencies? So the energy systems, cardiovascular system, um, improving our cardiovascular system or improving our anaerobic systems or like sprinting ability with a uh, creatine phosphate system and glycolysis system or is it from neurological development? So that is the question. Where do most strength, strength gains come from? Choose one of those in your head right now. Most of them come from neurological development. So we don't gain most of our strength from muscular growth or metabolism efficiencies, but actually neurological development. What does this mean? This means that the signal from the spinal column and the brain to the muscles becomes much more enforced and repetitive to where we're able to contract our muscles more efficiently. So this is why you're able to do a workout one week and the next week you have excessive str uh, strides forward and progression forward most likely is from neurological development, not from the other two. The other two are most important for long-term development, but the short-term gains that you typically see early on in a training cycle are from neurological development. Now, muscle growth. We're going to talk about muscle growth. There are two types of muscle growth. There's something called hypertrophy, and there's something called hyperplasia. Uh, so those are both muscle growth. So ba basically, if you look at a muscle belly, muscle belly is going to be bigger for hypertrophy and hyperplasia. The difference lies in how they grow. So these are healthy cells up here on the first line. Then you have hypertrophy. Hypertrophy is basically the same amount of muscle cells, but the muscle cells diameter are bigger than they were before. This is called hypertrophy, an increase in cell size. Conversely, instead of having an increase in cell size, you might have an increase in cell number. So in s you had three muscle cells. Now you have five muscle cells of the same size. The muscle belly is now bigger. This is called hyperplasia. Now, hypertrophy is basically what we talk about for most human growth. Um, it's very rare that we see hyperplasia in, in humans. There have been some cases and have been some studies on it, but for the most part, hypertrophy is really what we're talking about when we're talking about muscle growth. So in your own muscles, I'm going to say 99.9% .9 of us, um, when we look at our, our cells, that's what they're going to be. The muscle cell is going to grow in diameter. So when we're talking about muscle growth, most likely we're talking about hypertrophy. Now let's talk about basic biomechanics. So there are three basic movements or non-movements. Uh, the first one is called isometric contraction, basically where the muscle here is under tension. And so the muscle contracts but does not shorten and does not lengthen. So it's a static position, but it's under tension or under force. All right, this is called an isometric contraction. So holding something, holding yourself up in a pull-up position, holding yourself down hit right before you hit the ground in a push-up, or just doing a plank, those are all isometric contractions. Basically, you're under tension, but you don't 
move any. There's no shortening or lengthening of the muscles. This develops balance and stability. So that's what we're focusing on with isometric contractions. You're doing a plank, you're trying to develop balance and stability. All right. Um, many other types of exercises that you may do for, for this, but I want you to know that that is what is being developed when you use isometric, isometric contraction exercises. Then you do have some movements. You might have something called a concentric contraction or concentric movement. As you can see in this, in this dumbbell lift, this bicep lift, the movement is shortening the muscle belly. And so that's something called contracting, all right? <coughs> Concentric mo motion is when the shortening of a muscle occurs under force or tension. And so that's the up portion of a dumbbell lift. You have your dumbbell down, you move it up towards you, up towards your chest. Now your muscle belly has shortened. So that's called a concentric motion. This is shortening of a muscle under tension. This type of motion develops power and performance. All right, so when we do swimming, all right, we have our lats, we stretch out all the way in the water, and we have our lats that we pull the water, we're shortening our lats, our back muscles, and creating that power and performance so we can move forward in the water. Uh, so that's a concentric motion. Um, shortening our glutes, shortening our quadriceps, shortening our hamstrings. We're, all, we're doing all of that in order to push ourselves, whether it's cycling or whether it's running. Um, so we have all of those motions that are always concentric with power and performance. Um, you're doing a pull-up. All right, you do a pull-up in the up portion, so you go from the hanging portion up is power and performance, is shortening of a muscle under tension. And then you have the eccentric contraction or eccentric mo movements. These are lengthening of a muscle under tension or, gr or, uh, or force. So when we talk about eccentric motions, we're talking about development of strength or muscle growth. So eccentric contractions or movements develop more strength and muscle growth. And I want you to understand that there's a difference between strength and power and muscle growth and power and performance. We're not looking at the same thing and we don't actually develop those things at the same time. There is some crossover, obviously, but not, there is some uh, separation as well. So we have, have to understand that if we want to focus on strength and muscle growth, we work on eccentric con movements. So the down portion in a pull-up or, uh, or the down portion in a pull-up uh, or a push-up and or we we do a bench press, all right, and the down portion in a bench press, all of those down motions that lengthen the muscle work on strength and muscle growth versus a contracting motion, which focuses on power and performance. So I want you to remember those three types of contractions um, and understand which ones develop what. Then we have compression versus distraction forces. This is forces on the bones, so the structure of the body. These are forces produced by the body without the need for excessive power or fatigue. Basically, what's happening is bo the bones have this, these forces on them. So when we're talking about compression force or pushing force, where the, the forces are pushing the bone together, we're talking about a type of force created when you're locking your elbows during a push-up. You do a push-up, you lock your elbows, right? It's a lot easier to do that. And so you're able to lock your elbows and it allows you to stay up for a second so you can do the next push-up. Or same thing um, in any type of pushing motion when that locking. So if you stand up straight, it's a lot easier to stand up straight with your knees locked than it is to stand up straight with your knees bent because the muscles have to be under tension. When your, muscle, when your knees are locked, your bones are now under the tension. That's called compression force. On the flip side, you have something called distraction force. Distraction force is a force created when locking your elbows during a pull-up. So you're hanging there during a pull-up, and basically your bones have this force on them that's trying to pull them apart. That's called distraction force. 
Um, that's another type of force that I want you to understand. So if you're doing a pull-up and you did five pull-ups and you're trying to do the sixth and you have your elbows locked, you use some distraction force to, the, to recover slightly for a couple seconds, and then you do that last pull-up. That is called distraction force. Now, we do have a question of why we perform exercises with a controlled full range of motion couple things in here that we want to talk about. Range of motion is ROM. So if you ever see ROM, it means range of motion. Uh, range of motion is also the, the full range of motion is how far you can move any particular exercise. So if you do a bicep curl, you can have your arm completely straight and you can also have it completely flexed to your shoulder. Same thing with extension. All right, so that's a full range of motion for a bicep curl. You have a full extension, full flexion, and you get the full range of motion. Uh, same thing with putting your leg forward or back. Um, you might have abduction or adduction, depending on which direction your, bot your leg or arms may be moving. And so those two things equal the full range of motion. Uh, doing a pull-up, you're, ha you're hanging with your elbows locked. You come all the way up to where your elbows cannot move anymore. They're locked down below. Your chin is above the bar, and then you go all the way back down. That is a full range of motion for a pull-up. Now, why do we do that? We mitigate and decrease injury risk. That is the biggest portion of doing full ranges of motion. Well, that is one big portion of doing a full range of motion. So jerking or unstable motions outside a typical human range of motion will drastically increase the risk of acute or chronic injuries. And that's something, if your knee is tracking outward by an inch or, or an inch and a half while you're cycling, well, over a thousand, two thousand, three thousand rotations and when we talk about 3,000 3, rotations, if you're doing 200 rotations per minute, then we're talking, we're talking just a few minutes, right? Um, but when you're talking about hundreds of thousands of rotations, where you're doing thousands of hours or thousands of minutes even of training on a bike, well, you ha run the risk of a higher chronic injury load because of that uh, because of that unstable range of motion. And so we, that's why we want to perform exercises with a controlled full range of motion. Now also, the body does need to learn how to contract individual muscles from its starting to its ending point. So if you are doing a push-up and you're moving your body down to the floor three inches and back up three inches, you're going to get really good at moving the body three inches up and three inches down. But... Some studies have shown that you cannot grow as much muscle, you do not develop as much skill without going through that full range of motion. And so it's very important to go through that entire range of motion for an exercise. When you're swimming, stretching fully out in front of you and contracting all the way through the, the, the uh, catch, pull, push, and then finally the recovery, allows you to have better efficiency in the water, less energy intake, uh, less energy use, and less fatigue because of that. And your body learns how to contract through that full range of motion rather than reinventing the wheel every day. So those are some of the answers to why your exercise is performed with controlled full ranges of motion. Here's a perfect example of a proper pull-up where you're you're hanging completely, you're coming fully up to the bar, and you extend all the way back down. If we had a third, a third guy right next to him, he'd be looking exactly like he does in the first portion of the exercise. Um, and when we do this, not only are we growing muscle the most um, and stimulating our muscles the most and developing those skill sets, um, but also when we think about it, when we talked about contraction versus eccentric, when he goes from the low hanging position to the up hanging position, that's the contraction force, all right, the concentric movement. And so you go from the concentric movement to develop power and performance, and then you have to lower yourself down slowly, which is the purpose of lowering yourself down slowly during strength exercises to develop that eccentric motion, which works on strength and muscle growth. So remember, Working on strength 
and working on power and performance are two very separate things. So strength and muscle growth and power and performance, those are the two motions that are occurring here, the concentric and the eccentric motions. Then we have something called trigger points. I wanted to talk th about this in biomechanics because it does it does come come to light when you talk about these types of movements. Um, a trigger point is a sensitive area of the body, uh, stimulated or irritated, which causes a specific effect to another part, especially a tender area in a muscle that causes generalized muscular skeletal pain when overstimulated. Now, this is my biggest culprit, which is why I, I took this picture from triggerpoints.net. Um, basically where one portion of the body, these X's, are going to affect a potential array of all of these red marks here, where you have these trigger points, basically knots in the muscle fascia that occur. And when those knots occur, they tug on these other areas, causing these other areas to be sore. So where you're sore may not actually be the problem. It may be somewhere else. And the glute, glute min, gluteus min, minimus, this is my biggest issue for my own training. Um, and so I have, I have to constantly roll out using a foam roller or a lacrosse ball or something along those lines to release the tension. I get it right behind the knee, um, right down here. I get it in the peroneals over here. Um, I also get it in the glute max right here um, quite a bit. And so I roll up, up by the hip which releases down by the knee. That is called a trigger point. So you massage one area to release pain in another area. The X's represent the trigger point, wherever that fascia knot is. And there's no difference between the black and white X's here. Uh, the red shaded area is called referred pain caused by that trigger point. And the darker red means more people have experienced pain in that area. So um, over here towards towards the anterior side of the body or the front side of the body um, we're talking about there's less referred pain that occurs it does exist but there's less of it whereas more towards the back of the knee right here there's more of it so it depends on what people have experienced uh, but generally speaking the redder parts or more percentages of people have experienced that for that particular trigger point so this is a great profile to use is something called triggerpoints.net that allows you to see the body. You're able to pick on where your referred pain may be coming from. So you can click on your knee, click on your arm, click on your back, and it will show you different trigger points that may or may not exist for your particular situation uh, right on this graph, like a picture like is being shown on this slide right now. So de definitely take a look at triggerpoints.net. We'll talk about it more in the recovery section of um, of these discussions and finally the summary so where do most strength gains come from neurological development what do we talk about when we talk about human muscular growth usually hypertrophy very rarely hyperplasia we talked about basic biomechanics of isometric contractions or stability development concentric mo motions which is all about power and performance and eccentric movements which is all about strength and muscular growth we talked about compression versus distraction forces on the bones uh, we talked about injury risks and muscle development based on full ranges of motion and we want to go through full ranges of controlled motion to decrease injury risks and up muscular development and then using trigger point therapy as a recovery technique especially for these movement patterns that occur so that is the summary for biomechanics. Uh, thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you in the next lecture. Thank you.